I'm with Rabbi Dov Lippmann, former member of the Knesset and CEO of Yad Olam. Rabbi Dov, what were your thoughts on the massacre on the October the 7th and being an Orthodox Jew on the Shabbat? When did you get to hear about all of this? So I woke up on Shabbat morning and was getting ready for synagogue. It was also the holiday of Simchat Torah when we finished the reading of the entire five books of Moses. And the, I was in Jerusalem and the siren went off. And okay, I thought it was shocking that a siren went off, but I went to the safe room, I came out, I started walking to synagogue, and all of a sudden a man walked into synagogue and said, anybody here who's an army reservist must go home immediately and get your phones. We usually don't have our phones on the Sabbath, and everybody ran out and got them, and then one by one, they were getting called up to reserve duty, and we realized that the scope of what happened here was way beyond anything we could have ever imagined. And I'll go a step further. You know, I started thinking about my own son, who's an army reservist, and wondering, was he called up? And then throughout the morning, we started hearing rumors about, first it was 50 terrorists got through, then it was 100 got through, then it was 500 got through, then it was 1,000 got through. And then we started hearing about, oh, there are two hostages, there are five hostages. Everything was just chaotic. And it was really, really terrible. If you ask me, what do I think about it? I'll be honest with you, I still can't fully comprehend it. I'm not able to process and comprehend any human being who comes in and beheads babies. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't possibly comprehend a human being dismembering a mother's body or a child's body in front of the other. I can't imagine the raping of, of innocent women. I, I can't imagine burning whole families alive. So my, my, my answer is I can't even begin to process it. But there's one thing that I know. The only possible response is that the people responsible for this must be eradicated from the face of the earth. There's no other way. That's not for retribution. That's not for revenge. It can't bring the people who died back to the world, but it is going to remove the threat of monsters in the form of humans from the face of the earth. And that's what we must do. Now, so was your son called up and is he in the army today? Yes, he is. This was really, really horrific. And, and your family went through the Holocaust. Did it bring you memories of that? So I'll tell you where I tap into the Holocaust. There's two different fronts. One is, you know, I'm out there on social media posting positive messages about Israel, good stories, and, you know, po pointing out the battle of good versus evil that we're involved with. And I start getting thousands of messages from pro-Palestinians and pro-Gazans and pro-Hamas and they're talking about Heil Hitler and time for another Holocaust. So it just reminds me that we're in that same battle. But I tap into the Holocaust more for inspiration, to say that here there was a systematic process to destroy the Jewish people. And now look at where we are. We're in Israel. We're alive and well. The Nazis are gone. The German Empire is gone. And that's the covenant that God has given to us. And therefore, whenever I'm down and I say, what's going to happen here? I remember that we've survived horrors like this in the past. And with God's help, we'll survive this one as well. Now, Yadla Olam is very active in the war effort. What have you been doing? So uh, Yadla Olim, which, by the way, means a hand to the immigrants. Generally, our role is helping people from around the world who want to move to Israel, make Israel their home. We mobilized very quickly. We are involved with getting necessary equipment and materials to the IDF soldiers. We are involved with helping citizens of Israel get mental health support. We are involved with overseeing all the deliveries of the goods that are coming from all around the world and getting them through the tax authorities and getting them to the displaced people from the Gaza area or the soldiers who need them. Volunteer efforts, farming in the South, helping out with the army in a volunteer efforts, uh, medical professionals and others who want to help in the hospitals. So on all different levels, we've been involved. And anybody uh, who wants to hear more about it can contact me at yadlaolim.org. That's Y-A-D-L-O-L-I-M.org and contact us. You can also contribute towards our effort there. Uh, we certainly can use the help. And we've been really overwhelmed in a positive way by all the people who support Israel, love Israel, people of faith around the world who want to be involved and help in the effort. Providing for the soldiers, how important is that? And is that helping to save lives? Very much. First of all, even on a morale level, when soldiers get you know better mattresses to sleep on, blow up mattresses, or they get 
all kinds of other things, uh, warmer clothing, rain gear, that very much helps in terms of morale. But then there's also equipment. You know, the army gives them the best that they can, but we can give them even better goggles. We can give them even better flashlights. We can give them, you know, uh, uh, things which they need. Where, you know, the life and death type of equipment, that's the tactical gear, that's from the army. But everything else that we can add, it makes a very big difference. Like you have to see the looks on their faces as they get gifts from people around the world. It just lifts them up to realize they're fighting for all the forces of good in the world. And and therefore, on a morale level and on a practical level, it's extremely helpful. Mm. Uh, now, you're advocating for gun permits. Tell us a bit about that. Oh, yes. So many, many people all throughout Israel said, OK, that's it. The terrorists are able to come into our areas. We need guns. And Israel does allow people to have guns, but generally it's people who served in the IDF. So a lot of the people who are new immigrants who didn't serve in the IDF, many who actually had gun permits in their countries of origin, haven't been able to get them. So we're advocating for policy change to enable new immigrants to get guns. We do believe that they can be done in a responsible way. You know, it's amazing. Israel has guns all over the country, but you don't see the, the civilian mass shootings like you see in other places in the world because we're responsible for them. We know they're for self-defense, and we think it's very important to be able to arm any Israeli citizen who wants one and who passes all the tests necessary to be able to have their own guns. Now, you've been chartering airplanes. Are people who are Jews all around the world wanting to come back home and be part of this? The first step, which was amazing, was soldiers who were found themselves overseas and they wanted to come back and fight. And there were many people who got together and chartered planes, plane fulls of 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 22-year-olds who were on vacation somewhere, could have stayed there, but said, no, we're IDF soldiers, we're coming to fight. And that was unbelievable to see. And then there were other Israelis who just found themselves overseas and they don't want to be there during the battle. So we did what we could to help guide people. Again, there were some philanthropists who really got together. I know that Ron DeSantis in Florida flew a charter flight. Uh, many people got involved in that effort. And we just kind of put the word out to let people know about it. This is just brothers coming home to defend their land, is it? Yeah, really, really incredible. And by the way, I mean, just to give you a sense of the sacrifice, one of them was actually a lone soldier from Silver Spring, Maryland, which is where I moved to Israel from. And he was overseas visiting his family. He came back. And sadly, he was killed uh, fighting Hezbollah on the Lebanon border. So making the ultimate sacrifice when he wasn't even around at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you've written an open letter to President Biden. Tell us what you wrote. So... On the one hand, we are extremely thankful in Israel for the American response. I mean that, you know, they're given, you know, in the past, there's been so much pressure on Israel not to bomb, ceasefires, and, and President Biden clearly understands what we're up against, and he's been very supportive. There were some nerves in Israel, and I felt them as well. Is Israel being pressured to hold back? Israel be being pressured not to go in on the ground? And basically, my call to President Biden was, stay with us until the end. This is a defining moment in history of good versus evil, of light versus dark, and America should be on the side of uh, Israel on this and against the Hamas monsters. And I know that in the past, America has done that. What did America do in World War II when they were faced with war with Japan? If we invaded, if America invaded the mainland of Japan, the assessment was they would lose one million American soldiers. And therefore they dropped an atomic bomb killing, two atomic bombs, killing hundreds of thousands of Japanese, sadly, tragically, even civilians. But that's what you have to do to get victory. And here we are not targeting civilians. We are targeting Hamas, who sadly use those civilians as human shields. We have no choice but to bomb. We have no choice but to do it this way and calling on America to be with us till the end, uh, because those are the American values that I know from spending most of my life in the United States. Does Israel need to wait at the moment so they can try and get the hostages free? Or should they be going in doing this ground invasion now? So I'm not in the uh, know in terms of the negotiations. I know this. Israel is not at a point where we're going to transfer prisoners on our side for hostages on their side. This is not that situation. You know, do they see there's a possibility of getting some of the hostages out by waiting? Maybe. But the number one focus for Israel is defeating Hamas. Of course, we want the hostages to come back. Of course, we hope that that happens. I don't know that Hamas monsters are really in a place to do that. But 
I mean, again, let's remember people who take 10 month old children, two year old children, 85 year old women as hostages. I, I don't know that they're in a place to really do anything quote unquote humanitarian and let them out. The number one focus is destroying Hamas. By the way, a ground invasion could also play a role in helping hostages get free as well as the pressure surrounds Hamas. But the number one focus is destroying Hamas. The decisions will be made based on what's best for that. And uh, hopefully along the way, we can obviously bring the hostages back. Gaza seems to be in a bit of a circle, really, in some ways, because every six months to a year, Israel is dealing with Gaza. So if Israel goes in now, totally destroys Hamas, will this be good for the Palestinians as well as good for Israel? What people around the world have to know is that the Gazans living under Hamas rule, that's what's leaving them in the most horrific circumstances possible. And I guarantee you that if Hamas is removed from power and there's some other force, it can't be a terrorist force that's governing Gaza, all of a sudden they might see an opportunity for a decent life, which Hamas has deprived them of. So even though Israel is doing this for Israel's sake and to protect Israel in the future, there is definitely the added benefit for the people living in Gaza. What's it like for you as a father with a son in the army? It's very difficult to describe in words. You have to kind of live with this cognitive dissonance, like not even thinking about it very much. There's no doubt that prayer is intensified. I feel immense pride in the fact that at one o'clock in the afternoon, in the middle of a holiday, he got a call from the army and just dropped everything, left his wife and child, and has been there. It's a sense of pride. It's very, very challenging, though, to, to be the unknown and what's going to be. And I think about him, and I think about all the soldiers and all of their parents. So it's definitely unnerving, and it's definitely a time where we tap into deep, deep faith uh, to get us through. Does he get time off and do you get the chance to see him? So I drove up and visited him and he was given 24 hours to go home and spend time with his wife and son. But, you know, when you have a, a wife of a few years and a, a child who's two years old, you know, being away for weeks at a time is very, very challenging and very difficult. But at the same time, it's what we do. It's what we have to do to win. It's what we have to do to survive. And that's what we're going to do. Must be very challenging because, you know, he, he's going in and he's actually fighting a war. So you might be, this might be the last time you see him. So it must be very emotional, is it? There's a lot of emotion. You know, I give him the blessing that we give every Friday night whenever I see him. And there's certainly a lot of prayer. I think that we get through by thinking positive and by being proud and by tapping into faith and not really letting our minds go to any other places. How can Christians around the world be praying for you and your family? I would ask that on a daily basis, Christians pray uh, for the people of Israel, for the land of Israel, for the state of Israel, for the soldiers of Israel. You know, on a personal level, certainly uh, my life has been turned upside down, very busy helping in all these different efforts and the prayers for us, the prayers for my son Shlomo. That's all very much uh, appreciated. And as I mentioned before, if any Christians around the world want to get involved in the effort, they can go to the website yadleolim.org and contact us. We can find all different ways to get involved whether it's through volunteer efforts, sending things to the soldiers, or uh, financial support for our efforts. And of course, people need to be praying for the hostages in this hostage situation as well, don't they? That's for sure. I mean, I can't, I, I you know, I, I think that you're probably in the same place as, as a peace-loving, faithful human being. The mind can't really comprehend it. And I, I have to push it out of my head a little bit. Usually at night when I lay in bed, that's when my mind gets flooded with all this. And that's when I get emotion. And that's when I do think about them. And I do turn to God and, uh, you know, pray. In our morning prayers, we talk about God releasing those who are imprisoned as one of our prayers and one of our blessings. And I think about it every single morning. And, you know, I, I know that they're in the hands of ruthless, brutal monsters. And I don't know what they're going through. But God should give them strength, God should give them faith, and God should give them the miracle of being freed. As a rabbi, are people asking you, why us? Why is this again? There are questions along those lines. But, you know, my approach is, you know, that the Bible doesn't say that everything's going to be rosy. There are, you know, both at the end of Leviticus and the end of Deuteronomy, it talks about some terrible things happening to us. And we don't know why, and we don't understand the reasons why, but we don't question God over it. We just say that we don't understand but we know that at the end of every single one of those, something glorious happens. We know that on the heels of the Holocaust, the state of Israel was founded. We just know that. And we're living now in a time where open prophecies are coming true. And those prophecies talk about our return to the land, the reflourishing of the land, but also challenges in the land. And therefore, 
That's what I respond. Uh, we're part of a process. We're part of a people that has survived 2,000 years of persecution outside of our land. And now it's happening inside of our land. We're in a stronger place. We have our army. And with God's help, the end of the story will be a glorious one. We just have to have the perseverance and the faith to get through it. So we're living in exciting times, aren't we? There's definitely something momentous happening here. And also, I'll say this. When you see what's happening around the world with millions of people standing up on the side of monsters, mm. on the side of rapists, on the side of murderers, Murderers, it's a defining line where people have to stand up and say, which side am I on? Am I with Israel or am I against Israel? Because at this point in time, with Israel is good, with Israel is light, with Israel is faith, and against Israel is darkness, evil, and a complete lack of humanity. Uh, remind us of your website again for anyone around the world who'd like to know more or even help in the work. Absolutely. It's Yad Olim, Y-A-D as in David, L-O-L-I-M as in Mary, yadlaolim.org. And then contact us. You can reach out to me, ask how you can help, ask how you can contribute, and we'd be more than happy to have that partnership. Okay, Dove. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless.